be here with us today to talk about uh, health care reform and some of the things that we see happening uh, in the future. Uh, here we are a week following the election, and for a lot of us I think we thought that a week after the election, regardless of who was elected, we'd have a lot more clarity and a lot, on a, on a lot, a number, a greater number of things. One thing we do know for sure with the re-election of Barack Obama is that the Patient Protection Affordable Care Act, or Obamacare, is here to stay. That said, much of the impact remains unknown at this time, and we really don't completely understand the full effects of the law um, and how it will impact all of us as it begins to work through our systems. And I guess an analogy is it feels like that you're on the beginning of having a case of the flu. You're not quite sure how long it's going to last, and you're not quite sure how much it's going to hurt, but you know that you're probably going to have to face some sort of discomfort associated with it. Well, our job today and our job going forward and working with you is to help alleviate some of those symptoms and to make the issues around this a lot more clear. There is one thing, though, that's very clear about the situation that faces us vis-a-vis -vis health care, and that is that the costs of health care in this country continue to rise precipitously with no end really in sight. And as a population, we become sicker and sicker. That has nothing really to do with Obamacare, but it's an issue each of us as employers, each of us as, as individuals must face. As we sit here today, as organizations, we're all in somewhat different situations. In the case of Parker, Smith & Feek, we have about 400 employees and dependents insured on our plan. And our intent is always to provide a top drawer plan. We need to be competitive with what's happening in the marketplace today with the, with the employees and the employers that we're competing with every day. Uh, we also want to do a better job of controlling our own costs or our, our own issues. Five years ago, as an employer, I was sitting with our benefits team and we were talking about our increase for the coming year. And it was another big increase in rate. And we spend about two and a half million dollars on our health care, on our medical benefits program. And what I was seeing as I was more involved in this was year after year a steady, a steady spate of increases. And so as I talked to our team, I said, you know, we seem to go through the same machinations every year. We talk about, as an employer, how much of this are we going to absorb? How much, if any, are we going to pass back through to our employees? Can we tweak our deductibles? Can we go back to the marketplace and push down a couple of points the renewal? But I said, as it seems that what we're doing is just kicking the can down the road. And we're doing the same thing year after year, and I don't feel like I have any more understanding of my costs or any more control over bending this cost curve. What do we do? What's big and bold that we can practice and that we can take to our clients? So the idea we came up with, the five-year plan, was it began with us becoming self-insured. Even though we were a bit small to be able to do that and impose some risks to us, we felt that that was a necessary step to understanding what our losses were to begin to have a handle on how they work their way through our company and what we could do to begin to combat them. The second thing we did the next year was hire a wellness consultant to work with our clients, but also to work with us, to take this data, to work it again through our company, and to consult with our employees. Uh, I don't know how many of you have read the book or heard of uh, Younger Next Year. Uh, in that book, uh, in that book uh, the uh, one half of the writing team is an internist named Harry Lodge. And his epiphany in the beginning of the book, his 20-year practice in Manhattan, is that he suddenly realizes as he's watching his patients get older, what he's providing his patients is good medical care. He's not giving them great health care. And so he launches on this passion about not just addressing what medical issues are, but addressing how we look at health care in general, which is what we're trying to do with our employees and what we're trying to do on a consulting basis with our clients as well. Well, that set us on the path we're on today. Once we added a wellness complement to what we were doing in our firm, our next iteration was to add a health reimbursement account. The following year after that, we added 
a health savings account. And the intent here is to have our employees better understand the costs associated with their health care and the services they were provided, they were being provided, and to put them in a position of controlling more of their own money and making better cost-based decisions, to become better consumers. So where does that put us after five years? Well, I sat with our benefits team a few weeks ago, and what we talked about was that for the first time in memory, our losses have actually gone down. We're actually under what our expected loss pick was. And now we're looking at at least the fixed cost portion of our renewal for 2013 as being significantly less than it was last year. That's the first time in memory I have of our actual, our costs going down. Is this all due to what we've done? Is there some luck involved? And I guess the answer is yes and yes. Is it sustainable going forward? I think so. You know, only about 50% of our employees today are really actively engaged in our wellness program. And my hope in the next two or three years is that we engage another 25% and that we begin to, we begin to really make this a sea change. And irrespective of what Obamacare brings to us, that we fundamentally impacted, I think, what the most important thing that we have to deal with is we're not providing medical benefits to our employees and their dependents. We're providing them health care. As I said, we're all in different places as we sit here today about the decisions that we make, what Obamacare may or may not bring to us. That's going to require us as your consultants to look at you as an individual organization to help you understand the law, to help you deal with the issues that you have, and to help provide you with the best alternative possible as we move through this. Someone that's going to be key in that process for us and for you is our next speaker, Bob Radicke. Bob is with Benefit Comply from Minneapolis, Minnesota. They have an exclusive consulting relationship with us and with you. They're experts in benefit compliance, and they're going to be our lead navigator in taking us through this law and ensuring that regardless of what it means, we're in a position to provide you with the information and the options you need so that you can make the best economic decisions possible. Thank you for joining us. Hope you have a great conference, and I hope you come away with a sense that we're here to work with you to help you understand all these issues. Bob. Well, welcome everyone. Um, not surprisingly, we have a full room for, for today's topic. Um, thanks for the introduction, Greg. I, I, I uh, hail from Minnesota, and before I uh, uh, go into our content, I just want to point out uh, Kevin and I often talk about this. You have this reputation in, in Seattle for being cloudy, right? That's that's the stereotype. We actually looked it up, and Minnesota actually has more Minneapolis has more cloudy days than Seattle does on the average every year. How depressing is that? <laughs> um, nice Seattle weather, you're welcome. You. Um, so, before I get into the, the content, and there is a presentation, you've got a handout that will be following along, so you don't need to write down every single word I say. Um, just a bit more on what we're about and what we do. We're a consulting firm that focuses exclusively on employee benefits compliance issues. So all we do is focus on the rules around ERISA and HIPAA and COBRA, and then of course the 800-pound gorilla in the room today, the Affordable Care Act. And um, so our, what, what our relationship with Parker Smith, Smith is is wonderful because they have they, they, they have a holistic approach to your benefits. Um, I don't know how to spell underwriting. Okay, so we, what, we, we don't do all the other things that, that they do for you. And as a team, we focus on trying to, our job now for the next 18 months, 12 to 18 months, is to help you navigate through the changes that are now inevitable. Unless you're living on Mars, you know that we had a little event last week. And prior to that little event called an election, I had three separate talks prepared. I threw two of them away after spending many, many hours developing them, okay? And now we're on the road with version number three, which may sound strange for you to say is the easiest one for me to talk about. Because we've been working on this for two years. And I'm not saying it's gonna be easy. I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to take, make light of the work you all have to do. You've got busy you know, HR and benefits people are gonna have a busy time. But we now know what we're facing. 
the other presentations I was working on had a lot of, oh my gosh, I have no idea what this means in it, <laughs> and built into it. And even though we're going to have lots of change, and Greg mentioned that, where there's lots of things that I'm going to talk about that we still need guidance, that there's still going to be changes, uh, we know what we're going to be dealing with based essentially in 2014. So now it's our job to help figure out how to get you there. The second point I want to make, and I want to highlight, Greg also said this, but this, we can't make a big enough deal about this. This law affects each and every single one of you differently. There is no single way to say the ACA, and by the way, everybody calls it, I, I say the ACA because that's what the regulators use. So when we, when we spend our lives reading regulations, we always use the same language that the IRS and the HHS use. So the ACA impacts every employer differently based on your employee demographics, your plan design, your contribution strategy, your business strategy, right? And as uh, Kevin, as, as, the, as, our, as the benefits team at Parker Smith and Thiek, and, and we have been going through employer by employer, we're seeing dramatic differences. We're seeing one employer where the, the rule about affordable coverage really matters, and I'll talk about that in a minute. Okay. Um, and we'll see another employer where it didn't make a difference at all. There was, there was no risk there at all. So really our job for you the next 12, 18 months is help you figure out where you fit in that puzzle, right? and then help you do whatever you need to do, if anything. And that's what the surprising thing that some employers find out is there isn't a whole lot that they have to do to change. Others find that there is a tremendous amount of, 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 of change in strategy. So our job is to help you uh, uh, unwind that. So let me get a couple things out of the way before I um, start talking rules. Um, I have to always start my presentations with this. Uh, the debate leading up to this law was, shall we say, rather vigorous. It's a word I've been using for a couple of years. Uh, this is a picture of the Supreme Court uh, the day that they issued their uh, opinion. That's not normally what the Supreme Court looks like, okay? I need to say there has been a lot of debate, a lot of um, rancor, let's be honest, about, about this law. I wasn't surprised to see this picture of the Supreme Court uh, on the day they issued their opinion. I was a little surprised to see this. I'm not sure what a belly dancer has. This is in front of the Supreme Court. I have no idea what she's there for. Um, but she was also one of the people attending the event. Um, I'm Switzerland. You will not get a political opinion out of me if you throw me to the ground and tie my hands behind my back. I'm an analyst. I'm here to read the law. We consider ourselves interpreters. If you want to go to happy hour and debate the law, that's, that's a great thing about the United States. You, you do that to your heart's delight, but that's not what the, today's event is about. It's me trying to figure out what this means to, in, to the, the practical things about how you run, how you run your benefits. All right, um, the other thing I was going to say, this is, was billed as a post-election update. So we obviously have to mention the election, but I don't want to spend any time on it. You all watched it. You know the results. I can't tell you anything new you don't already know about the election. Uh, I want to spend our time on what it means to the Affordable Care Act. Um, but the only point I'll make about the election is simply that the makeup of our Congress really has not changed much, and that's what's relevant. right? What's relevant to, uh, uh, to the ACA is with the almost identical makeup of Congress, give or take a few bodies that have uh, changed hands, a uh, few seats have changed hands. Um, we're going to be dealing with the same political environment for the next 12 to 18 months before the implementation of this law, which means the House of Representatives is going to try to make more changes than the Senate is going to. That's just a fact, right? Because the Republicans control the House. Uh, the difference now is. They may actually have to compromise on some of these things. I'm pulling up crossed fingers here because prior to the election, of course, both sides were um, uh, hoping that the results of the election would give their side control over, over what happened here. That obviously, nothing's going to change before January 1st, 2014 in the makeup of the Congress, so we'll see. So there will be changes, but I think there'll be incremental, small, tinkering around the edge changes in Congress. There will not be a fundamental difference in the Affordable Care Act in 2014 and what we're dealing with today. <coughs> One issue I do want to bring up that um, I, I, we don't often bring a crystal ball out and, and predict what's going to happen, but this is an issue to really watch. Our Congress is facing an even bigger issue than the Affordable Care Act right now, in case you hadn't heard. It's called the budget. And the federal budget issue is going to consume the lame duck Congress. And one of the things the Congress is going to need to figure out how to do is to compromise or else we're going off the proverbial fiscal cliff we've all been hearing about. I put this slide up here because this surprises a lot of people. This slide shows you the lost revenue for different significant tax breaks we have in our, in our federal tax law. 
Okay, so our federal tax law has thousands of <laughs> tax breaks, but the, the number of, if these things were taxed at regular income levels, how much more money would the federal government collect? That's what this shows. Look at what number one is by a factor of two. The fact that our health insurance is tax free. And it's no secret that multiple legislators on both sides of the aisle have proposed over the past few years looking at the fact of whether health insurance benefits should be 100% tax free no matter what as something to reconsider. Again, I'm not predicting anything here, but I promise you this will be on the table. I mean, a lot of people are surprised. You look at the charitable contributions, the government loses a fraction, loses the relative term, you know what I'm saying? The, 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 the loss of revenue for charitable contributions is a fraction of what it is for our health insurance. So could we see some, well, I'll, I'll say this, I will predict, we will see some debate about these kind of tax breaks, all of them, not just the healthcare one, but you know, when you're dealing with the biggest one on the list, it's, it, it, I think it's fair to say that that will be a serious conversation about whether, and I'm not predicting that the uh, deductibility of health insurance is gonna go away, that's not what I'm saying. It's gonna be talked about, and will that possibly be part of the grand bargain we've been hearing about to uh, make progress on our uh, federal budget without going over the cliff. It's really interesting for those of the benefits world to watch, won't it? All right, the other thing that's going on now is a lot of the Affordable Care Act has much to do with what states decide to do. Each individual state has some flexibility in some significant areas of this law. In just a minute, we're gonna bring up Keith from Washington's State Exchange uh, Small Group Program. This, I'm actually really happy that, we, that Parker Smith is able to pull this together. I speak all over the country on, on, on health reform, and I don't keep up to date in detail in every single state's, I can't, in every single state's implementation of the state rules. I, I keep at a high level. So usually I can just comment on a very high level what's going on in state. In a few minutes, we're actually gonna bring up uh, the gentleman that actually is responsible for rolling out the small group uh, exchange in Washington so we can get a lot more detail on how that's going to work here than I would ever be able to provide you, so I'm actually kind of excited about that. Um, again, even in states, when you look at what changed in the states, there wasn't a huge change in either governors or control of state legislatures. There's a few, you know, Alaska and Oregon both had uh, uh, legislators, the legislative bodies uh, change hands. But again, it's relatively minor. Again, the point here is that, what does that mean? What's going to happen in the next 12 months is a lot like we've been thinking it's going to happen the last two years. There's not going to be a dramatic change in the number of states that move forward or don't move forward with these different rules. Two quick comments about the state exchange. Keith will go into it in detail, but there's a tremendous amount of confusion among everyone. I want to clear up right now. When people say an exchange, it's not a monolithic thing. There's two things happening on state-run exchanges. People will buy individual health insurance there. And that's where the subsidies are provided that I'm going to be talking about in a minute, when you buy individual health insurance through the exchange. And then some states, most states, are setting up a small group purchasing arrangement through the exchange. And Keith will be talking about, about specific to Washington, but they're two, diff they're, they're, they're two different um, efforts. They might not be happening through the same organization. I'm going to be focusing on how do those people get those subsidies, who, when they buy individual health insurance, could get subsidized, what does that mean to your employees? I'm going to be focusing on going and buying individual health insurance. Keith will be talking about the small group world, okay? That's that. So I want to make sure to differentiate between the two. All right. The other thing the states are struggling with right now is to decide whether they're going to expand Medicaid. You've all heard this political football through the, out the election season, is that once the Supreme Court ruled that states did not have to accept the Affordable Care Act's expansion of Medicaid, every state has to make an individual decision now. My understanding, and anybody from that's close to the government of any of the local states, is that it's pretty much a slam dunk that Washington, Oregon, and California are all going to expand their Medicaid services to the expanded ACA level. Alaska it currently is saying they're not going to. Okay? But again, that's subject to some uh, finalizing of some decisions in some states. The reason I want to bring up Medicaid to you employers is this. This is going to, for the first time in many of your lives as human resource and benefits managers, affect the employer's plan. Prior to the ACA, qualifying for Medicaid was either so limited or not even available to adults that you didn't have full-time active employees also qualifying for Medicaid. So prior to the ACA, 
Lots of states didn't even provide Medicaid to adults without children. Or if they did, it was only if they had incomes of less than 50% of federal poverty level. Well, you know what, if you got a full-time job, you have income of more than 50% of federal poverty level. So see my point? For the last 25 years in your, all your careers, you didn't have very many active full-time employees qualifying for Medicaid. When Medicaid is expanded to 138% of federal poverty level, look at the numbers. You know, a family of four that's making $30,000 a year potentially qualifies for Medicaid. So those of you that have now a significant number of lower income employees for the first time ever, you will have your active full-time employees possibly also qualifying for Medicaid. So what? Well, the so what is, as we sit down and look at our, our clients, us, that, that could have an impact on your health plan in a couple of different ways. Those employees that are paying you for coverage might say, well, why am I paying your $100 for, to stay in your health plan if I can go get free Medicaid? Right? Or you could have a situation where states take advantage of a program that's part of Medicaid where the states can actually enroll a Medicaid recipient in your plan. So uh, the, what, I want to take away, what I want you to take away today is, obviously, if you don't have very many low-income employees, and that's why I threw the chart up there so you can't get just a, a, a glimpse of what Medicaid eligibility levels will look like, this isn't going to have an impact on you. This is to highlight what Greg started with and why I said what I started. It affects every single employer differently, right? Um, I, I have to share this. We, we did a, an analysis, and this actually wasn't for Parker Smith and B clients, so I'm not picking on anyone locally, I promise. It was actually a New York group. Um, we, got, we did a health reform analysis for a New York employer. It was an investment banking firm. And they were concerned about the expansion of Medicaid. <laughs> they had no employees that made less than 4,000% of federal poverty level, much less 400% of federal poverty. The receptionist at that firm made more money than I did. Okay? Medicaid expansion was not going to impact that employer. Right? So that's just a... You know, a cute way of pointing out all of these rules can have significantly different impacts on you depending on your situation. The other thing I want to point out is um, the Medicaid expansion was a political, is a political football. Um, there, there is some prediction, there's been some studies done about the increase in costs because we're going to have a lot more people on Medicaid once it's expanded than we have today. That's one of the biggest parts of the ACA that uh, attacks the uninsured problem. It's got all these people qualifying for Medicaid that never used to. And so what I just put on the slide there is just a little bit of perspective. The federal government pays 100% of the cost of the new Medicaid eligibles for the first uh, three years. And then it goes down to picking up 90% of the cost going forward. But the states have to pick up 10%. So there will be increased cost for the states once that, re once that reduced. But most of the cost of the, of the increase in Medicaid coverage is going to be borne by the federal government. So that really poses an interesting question. If states choose not to opt, into the Medicaid expansion, who's actually saving the money? The federal government. Because if you, if you use simple math, if only half the states opt into Medicaid, the federal government's going to spend half of what they expected to spend on the Medicaid expansion. So it's going to be a really interesting one to watch in other states. Again, in this area, it sounds like it's pretty much a signed deal, or a done deal. If I had to talk to you about all the little uh, Affordable Care Act rules that are coming up in the next three or four months, we would be here till six o'clock tonight. So we weren't, we're not gonna do that to you today. In fact, we think that's what our job is at Parker Smith & Feek, is to help you figure out these uh, particular rules that are coming. So I do wanna just put up here, and, and it's in your slide, kind of your to-do list, if you will, right? So these are the things that you will be dealing with literally over the next weeks and months. These are not 2014 issues, these are today issues, right? You're starting to implement these new SBCs, these summaries of benefits and coverage that you're giving out to your employees um, to uh, uh, explain your benefits to them. A lot of people don't realize one of the most important points of those SBCs. It, it, the government, the, the, the law, let me back up a step, let me say it a different way. You always have given your employees information about your benefit plans. <laughs> You've had benefit summaries, we've helped you put them together, right? I mean, that's, that, this is nothing new. The reason why there's this new rule that people have missed, have, haven't connected the dots, is the reason why there's this uniform uni uh, summary benefits and coverage is that beginning in 2014, when I might have the option to go buy individual health insurance from the exchange and get subsidized, and I'm wondering what that coverage is like from the exchange, what do you think they're going to give me? A summary benefits and coverage that looks exactly like the summary benefits and coverage that you're here. Keith is going to be rolling out summary benefits and coverages for group, or your, your providers are, not you personally. <laughs> um, uh, you know, and, and the intent of the SBCs 
was that if I'm choosing between an individual health insurance plan on the exchange and my employer's plan or whatever, now I've got these three or four benefit summaries that are laid out apples to apples and I can compare them. That's the intent. Whether it works well or not, that's we can all debate. But that's why there's all the rules about how specific they have to be designed, why this information has to be in them the way they the, the way the rules say, is to facilitate that comparison. Okay. Um, the second one on there is W-2 reporting. Again, we can, uh, I'm not going to go through this in detail. If you have any questions about the W-2 reporting, contact us. We'll, we'll help you work through that. But the point here is not all of you have to worry about it, right? I want to make sure all the small employers in the room realize the exception for small employers. If you filed less than 250 W-2s in 2011, you don't have to do this. Now, I didn't say if you have less than 250 employees. Common confusion, right? You could have 150 employees, and if you got high turnover, you might have filed 300 W-2s last year, right? So if you file less than 250 W-2s, you don't have to worry about this. Obviously, if you filed more than 250 W-2s in 2011, you, you do have to do this with your W-2s coming out this year. Um, and you also know, oops, I got ahead of myself here. Um, the limits on the health FSAs we've been talking to you about, make sure that you take care of that, that you, if you have health FSAs, starting with plan years after January 1st, uh, you're going to need to limit those payroll deductions to $2,500. Another common misperception is the limit is on how much you can deduct from your employees' pay, not how much of a benefit the employees can get. You could have a health FSA that the employee deducts $2,500 pre-tax from their pay, and you could put $500 of employer money into their health FSA, and they have a $3,000 health FSA. That is legal. A lot of people think it's a limit on the benefit. It's not a limit on the benefit. It's a limit on how much you can pre-tax deduct from their pay. Big difference. Okay. So again, all these things are the things that we're going to, I have to use the cliche, hold your hand. But that's it doesn't quite mean that, it literally as it sounds, but help you navigate through. So I don't want to talk about that in as much detail. I want to spend more time on this one. This one, this one concerns me a bit. In, under the current rule, by March 1st of next year, you're going to have to send to all your employees what's called an exchange notice. That exchange notice is going to tell them there's this new thing called the exchange. People might be able to get individual coverage with a subsidy on that exchange. It's going to have to give you information about that. It's going to have Keith's home phone number on it if they have questions. <laughs> um, but the, the, the point of the employer notice for the exchange is simply that employ, to make employees aware of this. What's going to happen the day you, after you send out that notice to all your employees? B besides you going on vacation? <laughs> right? So what I want to spend the next 10 minutes or so on is talking about the infrastructure of how these subsidies work. Because not that you are... Not that the law requires you to be the individual personal insurance counselors for all your employees, but who do they call, right? And you have to at least understand enough to know what you don't want to talk about or what you do, okay? And this is one of the areas that I've seen very few. I go, I go to all the presentations and webinars that you do, and actually, let me digress just a minute. Some of you go to the webinars at Parker Smith and Pete Colds every month, and yes, I do speak at many of those webinars. And, uh, and I've had already three people today do the same thing that happens to me everywhere. Oh, you're the speaker in that webinar I listen to all the time. Oh, you look different than I thought you were. <laughs> and I was like this disappointed look on their face. <laughs> um, you always know, do that, whatever. Um, so, sorry. I do that and then I lose my, lose my place. Um, so what you need to understand is how the rules and the subsidies and, and, and those things work so that you know how to deal with your employees and how much you're going to deal with your employees. So let's go through quickly. No, nobody's talking about this much, and I want to describe to you in as brief a way as I can how I describe the Affordable Care Act. It is a carrot and a stick. This one isn't in your slides, um, uh, but the Affordable Act is a carrot and a stick, right? The stick that we all know is the individual mandate tax. In 2014, if you don't have health insurance, you're going to pay a tax. The carrot is the subsidies I'm going to talk about. That if your income and you meet, is low enough and you meet certain requirements, the federal government's going to help you pay for that individual health insurance. And your employees are going to be hearing about this in the news. They're going to be you know, hearing about it from their friends. I feel for all of you, just because you're in the HR department, every old aunt and uncle that you've never heard from for the last two years is going to call you and ask you questions. So we know a lot about the the the, the 
um, individual mandate tax. Um, if you have health insurance, you have Medicare, if you have uh, the military insurance, all those things count, you wouldn't be subject to the tax. But if you don't have one of these, you're gonna, here's the tax, you're gonna pay a tax of, in the first year, $295 a year, or 1% of your income. I don't think, I'm sorry, that's $95 the first year, it goes up after that. I don't think $95 tax in 2014 is gonna send a lot of people screaming down to Blue Cross to buy health insurance. But it goes up, and I'm going to go through some scenarios in just, in just a minute to show you the decisions that you, your family, your friends, and your employees will be making relative, could be making relative to this, but I want to show you for it. When I was here a couple of years ago, I actually used these next two slides, but I'm going to bring them up again every because everybody, people come to my presentations and they'll remember about two things, you know, about what I said, and this is always one of them. This is a very important tax law that I want to make sure that you're all aware of. Yeah, exactly. Right. Somebody was here last time was already laughing. You know exactly what I'm talking about. I found this when I was doing my 2007 taxes. I'll read it to you. If you steal property, you must report its fair market value in the income of the year you steal it. It's not done. Unless in the same year you return it to its rightful owner. This is a real law. All right. The first time I ever read this, I'm thinking, oh, you got to be kidding me. That's just stupid. My second thought was, I'm picturing the IRS going through returns and one auditor going, hey, Frank, we got another one. Call the FBI. You know, so, <laughs> some crook reported a stolen car. Um, there's actually a real reason for this. You steal, you're in jail, you're convicted, the IRS comes looking for their money. It's true. Isn't that awesome? I think that's, I think that's the way it should be. All right. Now let's talk about the carrots. The carrots are the subsidies that you haven't been hearing a lot about. People may be able to qualify for what's called an advanceable tax credit. The word advanceable is important because to get this tax credit, you don't have to go buy health insurance and pay for it for a year and then file your taxes to get your money back. The way the exchange is, one of the big operations the exchange is responsible for on the individual health insurance side is to administer the tax credits and the premiums employees have to pay. So if I qualify for a tax credit under these rules, I'll go buy an individual policy. Blue Cross might be charging 800 bucks for that policy, but if I qualify for a $500 tax credit, then I'm only going to pay 300 bucks a month. And the exchange is going to um, operate getting Blue Cross their money from the subsidies, and I pay my 300 bucks as, as I go along. So that's just in real simple, simplistic ways how, how it's going to work. The cost sharing reductions, I'm not going to go through detail, but are, are another part of the Affordable Care Act where if my income is low enough, I actually have some of my deductible and out-of-pockets waived, so my benefit gets better. So I might get a credit, I might get a tax credit to help me pay for the insurance, and depending on my income levels, my benefits and my deductibles might be lower. Um, this rule does not apply, and this I underlined it and put it in red. Okay, if there's only two things you remember, please make sure you're very familiar with this one. Nobody qualifies for a premium tax credit or any of the subsidies. Subsidies is my generic term. I'm referring to both the premium tax credit and the, and the cost sharing reductions. Nobody qualifies for the subsidy if they have affordable employer-sponsored insurance. I don't care how low your income is. So the law actually applies to anyone that makes less than 400% of federal poverty level. When you look at the list of 400% of federal poverty level, that's most, most of our country people. By the way, most of our country has incomes less than what you see on the screen, 400% of federal poverty level. Look, a family four making $90,000 a year, right, is of less than 400% of federal poverty level, okay? So everybody that makes less than 400% of federal poverty level technically could be eligible for a subsidy on the exchange except for what? If I have affordable employer-sponsored insurance. I'm gonna say this a couple of times. Remember that notice I warned you about you're gonna be sending out next March? and it's gonna be giving people information about these opportunities for credits, they're gonna be asking you things like, can I get the tax credit if I save my employer plan, right? I mean, the, the, the questions are gonna be crazy. I actually think this is a marketing opportunity for you. If you provide affordable insurance to all your full-time employees, when you do that notification, part of the messaging has to be, this is, we have to give you this, we have to tell you about this, right? but you are not gonna qualify for any of these subsidies because we give you such great benefits that's so affordable. I mean, I wanna say a little more tactfully than that, but you see, what I'm, you see what I'm saying? That's gonna be an important message to get across, and it is a positive message if that's what you're doing for them. So I think that has to go hand in hand with that 
notice thing that we're sending out. And by the way, that notice, the Department of Labor's, I'm sorry, HHS is supposed to release a, a model. We haven't seen it yet. So as soon as we get the model, we'll be distributing that to all of, all of our clients, obviously. Um, but I want you to take that opportunity is that's going to be the time you have to communicate things about how you do benefits again, right? And if you're providing affordable coverage, they're not going to qualify for a subsidy. And instead of a negative, I suggest you can turn that into a positive. So let's talk about a little more detail. Hang on, sorry, a little more detail about the subsidies. I already talked about um, if you're affo affordable health insurance, right? If you have affordable health insurance from your employer, you don't qualify for subsidy. So what the heck is affordable? You've heard this before. If you've been to any if you've been to any health reform seminar, you've heard people say that affordable is nine and a half percent of someone's income, right? So let me tell you two things: what we know about this, and a couple things that we don't know about this. To Greg's point, um, affordable is means that my cost for employee-only coverage is less than nine and a half percent of my household income for the employee. We still need guidance from the IRS about how this is going to impact families and dependents. Let me describe a simple scenario to you that will make this perfectly clear. What we know is that if you charge $50 for single coverage on your health plan, that's going to be affordable because that can't be 9.5% of anybody's income, right, for the employee. But what if you charge $500 for family coverage? What about my wife and kids? I, I don't know the answer to this, but I can tell you what I think is going to happen. I think we're going to get guidance that my wife and kids could qualify for a subsidy on the exchange depending on what it costs for them to enroll in my employer-sponsored health plan. So if that $500 to enroll them is more than 9.5% of my income, I'm going to stay on your plan because I'm not going to get any subsidy, but if we're lower income, my wife and children may go buy individual health insurance and get subsidized. Now, I'm, I'm speculating here. I'm going to be really, really clear about this. This has not been determined clearly by the IRS. The IRS has changed their opinion about this, and this is the direction it's going, and I'm speculating that this is what we're going to get when we get the final rules, but we're waiting on that one. Now, what's really important, the employer penalties that we talked about have nothing to do with the families. If that family member qualifies for a subsidy, there is no employer penalty. The employer penalties are contingent only on the employee's coverage. So it's important to make, make clear. But it's still going to have a big impact on you, right? Because I mean, if we have a lot of low-income employees, and we have a lot of those employees dropping family coverage and putting those families on the exchange instead, it could have a, a, an enrollment, a, a significant enrollment impact on us, but it wouldn't have any penalty impact. So now what I want to do is, is, is as we've been studying groups, this, this, once you see this, it's kind of obvious. You can do a back of the envelope here, and what's become apparent, a back of the envelope kind of calculation, what's become apparent is, very few full-time active employees are going to qualify for a subsidy. Why? Because most of you offer an affordable single coverage plan to them. Let me show you a couple of examples. Let's take somebody making only 10 bucks an hour. At 10 bucks an hour, oh, no, actually my first one isn't is 10 bucks an hour, is it? $24,000 a year. Okay, I did an example up there. Let's take somebody making $24,000 a year, not exactly a high-income employee, right? That's $2,000 a month, and we're just going to keep things really simple. We're going to assume that's their household income. I'm not going to get into the details, but just assume their household income is $2,000 a month. That means you would have to be charging what? You have to be charging more than $190 a month for single coverage for it to be unaffordable. Remember my uh, group that was concerned about Medicaid, my um, investment bank group I told you about? Um, they also charged zero for single coverage. We didn't need to do a sophisticated, detailed financial analysis to figure out that zero can never be 9.5% of anyone's income. So sometimes this answer is easy. Sometimes it's really hard. If you're charging 175 bucks a month and you've got a lot of low-income employees, we're running these and we're trying to figure out how many people might qualify for subsidy. What do we got to do about that? See, right back to my point, it affects every single employer differently. What's your employee wage base? What kind of benefits do you have? What kind of contribution scheme? Okay. The other one I threw up here was just, just again, just to, to drive the point home. Somebody making $60,000 a year, you'd have to charge more than $475 for single coverage for it to be unaffordable for that person making $60,000 a year. So a lot of you can sit there and you know, right? You, you know, at least to the great extent, how this, how this rule at least uh, might affect you. So now I want to go... Uh, we sat down one day and thought, look, we, we talk about all these rules and they're so confusing. 
how can we get really practical? How can we show you what are people going to be thinking about and decisions they're going to be making? So what we did is we actually just went to Minnesota Blue Cross, and this was just a couple months ago, and shopped a $2,500, $3,000 deductible plan. The reason we picked that is the subsidies are based on what's called silver coverage, which is going to be something like a $2,500 $3,000. Don't, don't hold it against me, Keith. I know it's more complicated than that, but silver coverage on the exchange is going to be around a $2,500 deductible plan. So we went to Blue Cross in Minnesota, just for the heck of it. So what could these two people buy a $2,500 or $3,000 deductible plan for? We'd use a 30-year-old male and a 50, or 30-year-old employee and a 50-year-old employee, one single, one family. And then we went to the calculations in the law about how much would that person pay for similar coverage on the exchange if they qualify for subsidy. With me? Because the law actually defines the maximum you would pay. I'm going to say this again. I said it earlier, but make this real clear. When someone qualifies for subsidy on the exchange and they go buy individual coverage, Blue Cross or I, mean, I don't want to pick on anybody, whatever health insurance company is, 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 is selling individual coverage, if they're charging $800 for a policy, they get their $800. Bucks. But what the person would pay is capped by a formula in the law. See what I'm saying? So the subsidy, and that formula, the lower your income, the more you get. Not surprisingly, right? So somebody making 399% of federal poverty level, the subsidy might be tiny or non-existent. Somebody making 150% of federal poverty level, the subsidy is much greater. So that's really easy to kind of just describe in detail. It made absolutely no sense to you whatsoever until you look at the examples, okay? So let's look at our 30-year-old family of four. And I went and I found out that 30-year-old family of four in Minnesota a couple months ago could have bought a policy for about 600 bucks a month. And it's not really relevant what the rates here are. You get the point I'm making, right? Your rates might be different, but you get the point. If that person's income, if that family's income was $70,000 a year, that puts them at 300% of federal poverty level. The max they would pay for that same policy on the exchange would be 556 bucks a month. Basically, they're getting a subsidy of 40 bucks. Interesting, right? But if that same family had an income of only $35,000 a year, that puts them at 150% of federal poverty level, the max that family would pay for that same policy is $117 a month. Because their income is that much lower. Get it? Get how it works now? And age matters, unfortunately, to old guys like me. If you look at the 50-year-old family, their family of four coverage was nine uh, was nine hundred and eighteen bucks because you know individual policies are age rated to some extent. That's going to be changing a bit, but they're still going to be age rated a little bit. Okay, and that family, that same family, if their income was that thirty five thousand dollars a year, will only pay that one hundred and seventeen dollar maximum premium. That's a heck of a subsidy. That's a heck of a care, right? But who gets these? The uninsured. What's the main I mean, I'll, I'll, this is not a political statement, I promise. But what is one of the main goals of the Affordable Care Act? To reduce the number of uninsured, whether you like it or not. Okay? The number of uninsured is directly related to income. That's just a fact. So the larger subsidies for the lower income is a targeted attempt to get more 50-year-old families that make only $35,000 a year to be able to afford an individual health insurance policy for $117 a month. That's how it works. All right? So this is what people are going to be doing in 2014. It's decision time for some people, right? Do I pay the tax and the penalty? I'm sorry, it's not a penalty. It's a tax, just as Robert, Roberts explained that to us. Do I pay the tax or do I go buy health insurance? And so I just put up it again. This is the, you know, that 30-year-old that, that family in my example here, or actually, this is an, I just had to use an individual. 30 old, the 30 year old individual making $17,000 a year. In 2016, when the tax is at its full, remember I showed it went up from 2014 to 2016, the individual mandate tax increases. In 2016, when the tax is $695, that person would pay $690 at that income level for a health plan on the exchange. You think they're gonna pay the tax to the IRS of $695 or go buy health insurance for $690? That's a pretty easy one, right? The next one isn't quite so easy. The 50-year-old family of four, um, in their case, they would pay a tax of $2,000 if they don't have health insurance, over $2,000, but they're still gonna pay 6,600 bucks to buy health insurance for the family at that income level. They're making 70 grand a year. 
So are they going to pay a $2,000 tax to the IRS for nothing if they're uninsured? Or are they going to go buy health insurance for $6,000? I don't know. That's, that's up to them. But these are the kind of decisions people are making if they qualify for these subsidies. Let's come back to you now. That's enough about your employees, or enough about individuals. Your employees are going to be thinking about this, and they're going to be hearing about this, and their next door neighbor is going to be talking about this, even if they don't qualify for the subsidy, right? So that's why, that's why and, and you have part-time employees. You all, not all of you have all full-time employees that have benefits. You have part-time employees you don't give benefits to. This is what they're going to be looking at. Yes, ma'am. Um, how does this, all of this work with the number of employees that you have? Because I've read about, you know, different thresholds if you've got 50 or less, and then 100 or less that happens some years going forward. So I understand most of what you've talked about, but how does the number of employees you have, how does that trigger whatever? Great question. I'll repeat it for everybody. Um, the question is, how does the number of employees that this company has affect these things I've been talking about. Well, actually, it doesn't directly affect this. Um, whether I work for a two-life company or a 20,000-life company, the question is still the same. Do I have affordable sponsored insurance, okay, before I can qualify for a subsidy? Where you're talking about there is a huge impact is the employer penalties that I'm going to just mention next only apply to employers with 50 or more full-time employee equivalent. So, um, and I get, in fact, that's a nice segue. Thank you. You move to the next slide and you want me to move on, obviously. That's what you're <laughs> um, So, the penalties, the employer penalties, and we've talked about this so many, I mean, you've all been to a 10 health reform seminars, so you've heard about these penalties. I'm not going to go into great detail, but there's two kinds of employer penalties that could apply to an employer, right? There's a penalty if your coverage is unaffordable, if you charge too much, and one of your employees qualifies for subsidized coverage then you're gonna pay a penalty of $250 a month if that employee goes and purchases subsidized individual health insurance per employee. Three, that's at $3,000 a year penalty, okay? The other penalty is if you don't provide benefits to your full-time employees, that's that big one you've been hearing about, you're gonna pay a penalty of $2,000 a year times all your employees, not counting the first 30, if you don't provide benefits to all your full-time employees. Two completely different penalties. But both of them, to your question, those employee pe employer penalties only apply to employers with 50 or more full-time equivalents. Now be careful with what I just said. You have to consider part-timers to know whether you're invited to this party or not, okay? If you have 30 full-time employees and 100 part-timers, when I prorate and calculate your part-time FTEs, you would be over 50 probably and you would be subject to these rules. You only have to provide coverage to your full-time employees. You don't, have to, you don't have to give coverage to your part-timers. You just have to count them to know whether you're an applicable large employer. And we can help you do that calculation if you're one of those on the fence, okay? So I'm gonna go back to, for two years you've been going to seminars and my webinars and seminars and everybody, I'm not, I'm not criticizing other people and hearing about these penalties and hearing about this $3,000 penalty thing. But if you think back to what I said about how many employees are going to qualify for a subsidy, right? When we talk about, you know, at $24,000 a year, you have to charge more than $190 a month for somebody to qualify for a subsidy. A lot of you know pretty quickly that that affordable employer penalty isn't going to apply to you. If you charge $50 a month for single coverage, you will never pay that penalty. And, 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 and 50 is not a magic number. I just pulled that out of the air because it's, it's obvious, right? But that's, again, that's what we're doing. We're sitting down and plowing through all of our groups and looking at contributions and looking at the employees' wages and trying to figure that out for, for each of you. All right. Another thing that we want you to think about, and you may have, you may have seen me, uh, and, and, and I know your, your representatives from Parker Smith and Beacons have talked to you about this. When the law first came out, we got a lot of emails that said, oh, wow, I only have to pay $2,000 penalty if I don't offer health insurance. That's a lot less than I pay for health insurance, so I should drop top health insurance. Right? That's, that's simple. Well, what we're trying to do is have a little more detailed conversation around that because it isn't that simple. You know that. I mean, I'm, a, I'm preaching to the choir here. But if you're not going to provide health insurance, um, I, I happen to know that if we decided at Parker Smith & Peak to not provide health insurance to our employees anymore, 
Um, uh, some of those employees would be at Greg's office the next day wondering what we're going to get instead. Right? I mean, we might have some expectation of some compensation in lieu of the benefits we used to get. That's a, that's a you know, the blinding puts to the obvious. So when you're talking about whether you're going to offer health benefits or not, you have to factor in thinking about are you going to have to provide some additional comp because those people are going to have to go out and buy their own individual health insurance now, right? And are you going to provide some income to them to, to, um, to take care of that or help take care of that? Huge part of the conversation. What we often find when we have real detailed conversations with employers is that completely changes the picture because you don't want a mutiny on your hands either, right? And so once you start factoring that, and by the way, don't forget if you uh, give your employees additional compensation that you're going to be paying additional payroll taxes as an employer that you don't pay when you offer health insurance, right? Oh, and also don't forget that the penalty is not tax deductible to the employer. So if you're paying a penalty because you don't offer coverage, that's not tax deductible. It's going to have a negative tax impact on your company. And then one of the property casualty um, staff at Parker Smith pointed out something I've totally forgotten about. Your work comp rates are a function of your payroll. So if your payroll goes up by a million dollars, that's going to have an impact on your work comp rates. Okay. So get, the point here is not to go through this in detail with each one of you. The point is, if you're seriously thinking about that as an alternative, you really have to sit down and do the detailed analysis of what are all the different financial pieces of the pie that you have to consider and what does that mean for your company, right? All right, last thing. On August uh, 31st, the Friday before Labor Day, the IRS released probably one of the most important set of rules uh, with the Affordable Care Act for some of you, and that is this new alternative definition of full-time employee. We could spend an hour on this and we don't have that time, so I, what my goal here in the next two minutes is to explain the rule to enough level of detail that you all will know whether it matters to you or not. And then it's gonna be our job to sit down and help you unwind how this, this may or may not apply to you. Here's the point. A nice woman in the back asked about the, how big of a company does it matter when the employer penalties you know, apply, right? And I said 50 or more. The basic rule is if you have 50 or more FTEs, you have to provide qualifying coverage to all your full-time employees. That, those three words are huge, right? Who is a full-time employee? Well, the law says it's anybody that works an average of 30 hours a week. Well, that's interesting because you used to maybe only provide benefits of 35 or 40. We know we got to go to 30, but that doesn't answer the question for those who have variable hour employees, restaurants, hotels, construction firms, landscape firms in Minnesota that work three months out of the year. So they snow the rest of the year. Um, all these employees that have seasonal and variable hour employees, what's 30 hours a week? You know, how, how do we calculate it? So the IRS is attempting to address that with this new definition of full-time employees that allows some employers to use what's called a look-back measurement period, all right? I'm gonna describe it once, but I'm gonna give you an example that I think will probably be better uh, than anything I could describe. Basically how it works is for certain employees, and this only applies to what are called variable hour and seasonal employees. So it only applies to employees who, whose hours vary from week to week and month to month, okay? Listen, Parker Smith and Fee, we all work 80 hours a week all year long on your behalf. Our hours don't vary, okay? So it doesn't apply to us. But if you're a restaurant, because there's some of the other groups where hours vary month to month, month over month, this could be huge. And what it's gonna allow us to do is set up a measurement period. And the measurement period will say, for certain employees, they have to work full time during that measurement period before they earn full time status. And the employer gets to pick a measurement period between three and 12 months. So let me just describe a simple scenario. And again, this is in your, this is in your uh, slide, so this is the best way to uh, imagine a simple application of this. Let's say I'm an employer that has lots of employees whose hours are 30 some week, 20 some week, oops, sorry, um, you know, varies all of them, maybe I've got some seasonal employees. For those employees, I'm going to impose a new eligibility rule that says you're not eligible for benefits until you earn full-time status. And you have to go through a 12-month measurement period, and you have to work full-time that whole 12 months to earn full-time. I, I, I run a shoe store down at the mall. I hire two employees. I don't know what their hours are going to be this year. It's going to, you know, it's going to be all over the map. After 12 months, the first employee I look back, they average 31 hours a week. They've earned full-time status, and now I'm going to have to offer them benefits for my next plan year, which is called the stability period for the new rules. Okay? 
Employee number two I hired only averaged 27 hours a week for the last 12 months. Not a full-time employee. Doesn't have to offer benefits. I don't have to offer benefits. And I'm going to measure those variable hour employees every year to determine whether the next year I have to offer them benefits. Kevin's going to talk a little bit about analysis we did for one of their clients when we get up here. But what I want you to leave with is if you're all full, if, if you're or if you're staffing as all full-time employees and hours don't vary, you know, you hire as full-time and, and this isn't something that's going to be huge for you. If you are one of those employers that have a lot of variable employees or seasonal employees, we have to sit down and see if this may make a big difference in who is going to qualify for benefits. Just one question here. Um, how does this impact, I, I uh, couldn't make the eligibility period more than 90 days. Mm. Great point. The point here was she had heard that there, we can't have a waiting period of more than 90 days. That's true. It's two different things. We cannot have a waiting period starting in 2014 for more than 90 days for our regular full-time employees. So if you're hiring someone and you're hiring them full-time and they're expected to work 30 hours or more a week, you can have a waiting period of no more than 90 days. By the way, a little, a little quick hint about that. That's not first of the month following 90 days. It's 90 days. So you, you couldn't have a waiting period of first of the month following 90 days if that's more than 90 days. Okay? It would be first of the month following 60 days you could have. Okay. But that's for regular full-time employees. I'm talking about these seasonal and variable hour employees. We have to classify them as seasonal and variable hour. And for them, we actually can make them earn it through, the, through, the, through that measurement period before they earn full-time status. So that classification of who gets that is going to be really, really important. I'm going to stay around. I know there's lots of questions. I, I want, I, I'm really interested in what Keith's got to say about what's happening in the small group exchange in Washington. So I'm going to turn it over to him now. But I will stay around afterwards. We've got a, a lot of partners with the big staff here that can answer questions. And you know what? This is just a start. Here's the deal. Our job is to help you navigate through the changes, if there are any for you, over the next 12 to 18 months. Um, it is a lot of work. But I will just give you a couple quick, maybe positive thoughts to leave you with. We lived through ERISA. We lived through COBRA. We lived through the implementation of the FMLA. Um, it, it is going to be a lot of work for you, but we will get you through this. Um, we will have your plans running properly next year and help you make the decisions you need to make. Um, you've just got a busy year coming if you're in the benefits and, and human resource area. So we'll, we'll, we'll try to help the best we can. I'd like to bring up uh, Keith Bell. Keith is the director of the Washington State Shop Program, which is the small business part of the exchange. Remember, I was talking about going and buying individual health insurance on the exchange. And Keith's going to talk about the plans the state of Washington has for offering small group plans on, on the exchange and what that means to those of you that are small employers. So welcome Keith, Keith up here. And then again, I'll be around for questions afterwards if you have more. Good morning. Oh, morning. For Good morning. Good morning. All right. Okay. Um, like as Bob mentioned, my name is Keith Bell, and I am the uh, shop director. Um, I will say that I have been uh, with the exchange now about two months, and there's one thing I will guarantee you is that uh, you will probably be asked me a question that I can't answer. Okay. Um, as one of our board members put it, we're kind of uh, flying this plane, plane as we build it. So uh, there's a lot, a lot going on. We're still waiting for legislation uh, guidance from HSS, HHS. Um, they were at the exchange last week for a full day site visit, and we're expecting some of that guidance to come out hopefully next week. But um, um, we're still, we're still waiting for some of that information. Wait, it just stay here. All right, am I going the wrong way? There we go. Today's agenda. Okay. Uh, what I want to do is I'm going to talk a little bit about kind of the highlights of the uh, ACA, uh, kind of show you kind of where we are in the exchange at this point and kind of timeline of where we're, where we're trying, what we're trying to get to. Um, talk uh, a bit about the shop and um, how that works for small employers. A lot of it, I'll tell you probably the, the biggest value that the shop has is the tax credit because you can't get the tax credit outside the exchange. Um, we'll talk about that and how that works. Bob did a good job of covering that. And then we'll, I'll talk a little bit about next steps. Okay, changes to the uh, Affordable Care Act. Um, big change is that now um, we can cover your, your kids up to 26 years old. I have a daughter who's a senior at the University of Washington. I can now keep her on my plan until, she, until she's 26. Um, 
lifetime, um, uh, those out-of-pocket ma out maximums, those plans that basically said you have a million dollars of lifetime coverage, those things are going away as well. Um, uh, medical loss ratio. Um, they're under the law, uh, all carriers, 85% of uh, all premiums have to go towards health care. There is a law right now in Congress right now that uh, did pass the House that would make uh, broker commissions exempt to that. It's in the Senate. Um, we don't expect that to pass. Um, they are closing the donut hole. Uh, Bob talked about the individual mandate, and he also talked about Medicaid and um, and the uh, and the small business uh, tax credits. We'll talk a little bit about that more about that in just a little bit. Overview of the exchange. Right now, we're a state-based exchange, and we're what is called a private-public partnership, and we still are trying to figure out what that is um, because. Uh, in about another year, we have to be totally separate from the state. So right now, if you were to email me or get an email from me, you would my email address is with the healthcare authority. Uh, that has to change uh, by 2014. Um, we have to have qualified health plans, and the, and the OIC is uh, is developing those, those qualified health plans. Something that's going to be different in the exchange for for small employers, and we're going to have what we call the metallic level tiers. Basically, they're going to be bronze through um, bronze through platinum. And uh, an employer will, be able, will have two options. An employer can go in and say, I want a single plan option, much like they do now, and then they'll pick a Blue Cross plan, and the, employers will then go, the employees will then go in and load their spouses. Or the employer can go out and pick, say, a gold plan. And at that point, the employees will go in, and they have the option of picking any gold plan that's on the exchange. So an employer could have employees with a, with a gold plan that's from Premier, from Regions from Group Health, from Kaiser, it doesn't matter. They can pick any gold plan they, they want, and that's, that's new. Um, we also will have 10 essential health benefits, and we're looking for the OIC to uh, give um, more guidance on that probably around the 19th of, of December. Something that's, that's going to be new that a lot of folks are talking about is the whole issue of navigators and the, what role do they play. Navigators are not licensed agents or brokers. Um, they will be organizations much like, uh, say, a, a Sheba volunteer. Um, You'll see uh, uh, navigators will be, I don't know if you're familiar with the community health centers. Those folks who will help uh, uh, folks get onto the Medicaid or uh, Medicaid plans. So those will be navigators. And under the, under the law, navigators are not to, to enroll people into the exchange. Their goal is to provide information. Um, agents and brokers will have a role. I'm not exactly sure how that's going to look yet, but uh, they will have the role. Their role will be to help uh, folks enroll into the exchange. Okay, what have we done so far? Well, HA, uh, we received a $22 million grant. Um, interesting with this grant money, and one of the things that we cannot do with this grant money is that we are not allowed to pay agents and broker commissions with this grant money. Um, you know, this uh, SSB 544, which basically makes us a private public entity, and again, we're still trying to figure out what that all means. Um, and the governor um, named, uh, named the exchange board this year as well. Um, we also passed 2319. 2319 deals with uh, pedi pedi pediatric dental, and it is a mandate that we have to have pediatric dental in exchange, um, and it has to be a standalone plan. We also received another $128 million in grant money. Um, we also um, just submitted our blueprint plan to, blueprint plan to HS, HHS. Uh, to be certified as an exchange. And again, they had their site visit last week. And uh, one of the big things that we're dealing with is a sustainability plan, which has to be submitted to the legislature uh, next month. Okay. The goal is that um, we need to be certified uh, next year by HHS. Um, open enrollment is slated for October 1st. Our, we are on track, and as far as the shop, our goal is that uh, employers will be able to go in and begin loading information into the shop for their employees uh, September 1st, and we're on track to make that happen. Okay, governance. Um, the governor named a 11-member bipartisan board on, on March 15th. Uh, these meetings are open to the public. Uh, you can give testimony. In fact, uh, I will be presenting to the board on Friday, and I will be presenting a recommendation for how agents and brokers uh, participate in exchange. And those meetings are held out at the Radisson uh, up by the airport and anyone is welcome to join those meetings. Um, there are a number of stakeholders. 
We have seven different stakeholder meetings, that, uh, committees, everything from an adv advisory board to operations to uh, agent broker, task force. Um, I mean, the list goes on and on and on. So again, all those meetings are open to the public. Um, they're on our website. You can call in and listen to those meetings. Um, they have to at least once a month. This next slide is just to kind of give you an idea of who our board members are. Um, pretty divorce, divorce board. Um, as you can see, uh, Mr. Kreitler is also on the board. Uh, Margaret Stanley is our chair. Um, you may be familiar with uh, uh, Bill Baldwin. He's also a board member. Okay, let's talk about the value proposition for the exchange. The number one goal for the exchange that we have is that uh, access to care. So when you talk to anyone who's with the exchange, that will be the number one thing that they will talk about is, is access. Um, I mentioned that uh, we have to have qualified health plans. Um, uh, the OIC is developing what those, what those look like. Um, you'll be able to compare and purchase on the exchange. So you'll be able to have, there's 20 different plans, you'll be able to look at those plans side by side and decide which plans meet, meet your need. Um, and right now, a small group is uh, a small group plan. Is an employer has anywhere from two to fifty employees. Um, what we're hoping to happen on the on the public side is that there's a, a, a reduction in uninsured, that uh, we have in health enhanced uh, po uh, population wellness. Um, the idea of the exchange is that we have a competitive marketplace, and hopefully, um, as we build this thing, uh, we'll see a reduction in, in premiums. And the idea is also that what you buy in the exchange. You, what, what you see in the exchange, will you also see outside the exchange. So you'll see the same, uh, the same health plans outside the exchange that you buy in the exchange. And one of the advantages that we're going to have in the exchange is that you have the tax credit. And also, outside the exchange, the, the contribution rate for employers is 75%. Inside the exchange, the contribution rate is going to be 50%. Okay, let's talk a little bit about the shop. Bob talked talk about this a bit, but organizations with 25 or fewer workers um, will be eligible for the tax credit uh, those, as long as that those workers have incomes of $50,000 or less. Uh, beginning 2016, um, the shop will, will, will be able to uh, offer uh, benefits to employees, uh, uh, companies up to 100, and in 2017 we can then offer uh, health care benefits for uh, large employers over 100 employees. Tax credit eligibility, as it stands right now, um, if you're a small employer with 25 or less, 35% uh, of that premium is, can be, can be a, a credit, and if you are a, a tax-exempt employer, it's 25%. 2014, that number goes to 50% and 35%, and 50% of the cost uh, of a single, not family, health care coverage for an employee. So what that means is that when a, as an employer, for to be eligible for the tax credit, you don't get credit for the entire family, but for your employees. Okay? And again, the minimum contribution for an employer is 50% of that premium. Employees with 25 or fewer employees must average less than $50,000. And if you have 10 employees or less, the, the average wages must be $25,000 or less. How the tax credit works, uh, again, it's right now it's up to 35% of the premium. Um, kind of covered all this. Full credit, to, full credit to employers with 10 or fewer employees with equivalent employees and average annual wages of uh, $25,000 or less. 2014, a big difference is that, again, uh, that will go to 50% and 35% for uh, uh, tax exempt employers. What this next slide does is kind of give you an example of how, this, how the tax credit works. For instance, on this first one, if you had 10 employees uh, with wages of a total premium of $250,000, your uh, credit on this one would be 35% or $24,000. And in 2014, that would go to 50%. So at that point, basically half of your premium you pay would be a tax credit in this first example. The next example is for uh, part-time employees. And remember, uh, 20 part-time employees, uh, would um, 40 part-time employees would equal 20 full-time employees. Um, the, the premium of $240,000, 35% credit would be $28,000, and again, on uh, 2014, that goes to 50%. This last example is uh, for a nonprofit. Um, again, right now it's at 25% at $18,000. 2014, it, it goes to 35%. Okay, Bob mentioned this in his presentation. Um, and employees, employees require that their contribution, contribution cannot exceed more than 9.5% of, of the family household income. The benefit plans that, we, that will be designed, and we expect to see those sometime in March, 
um, the, plan must, uh, the plan design must pay at least 60% of the covered benefits. And employees, again, uh, with less than 30 hours are considered uh, part-time. In the exchange, we will, there will be coverage for the employees, for part-time employees, if the employer wants to do that. But the contribution rate won't drop. The contribution rate will still be at 50%. Going forward, uh, probably the, the two biggest issues that the exchange needs to, has to deal with are three biggest issues. One is the navigator program and what that will look like. Uh, expect uh, some guidance on that probably next week. Uh, the role of agents and brokers is an interesting one. Um, agent brokers will have a role in the exchange. And uh, one of the options that we have is to try and mirror commissions outside the exchange. So for instance, uh, if a Regis does a P and PM on their current plans, Inside the exchange, if they sold a Regis plan, they would get a PM, PM amount. Uh, group Health does 5% of premium outside the exchange. Inside the exchange, we would do the same thing. So we're looking at options to do that. Um, again, I think I mentioned that uh, under the law, we cannot use um, uh, uh, grant dollars to pay agents and brokers. Um, so that's an issue for us, and uh, we're working through that. But what we'll, we'll probably see is those premiums, those commissions built into the, built into the premiums, and we will, we will mirror what goes on outside the exchange. Um, sustainability is huge, and um, we will be uh, delivering a sustainability plan to, to the legislature next month. I want to just let you know, on the website, um, anything you want to know about what's going on in the exchange is on the website. Um, all of the meetings, all the meeting notes, the phone numbers you can call in if you want to listen in on all those calls are there. Um, there's a lot of information there. I, I, I encourage you to go out to the website because uh, everything is tracked there. And with that, that's all I have. Yes? Can you, can you comment? Have, have any of the carriers committed to, do carriers have the option to offer their group plans to the exchange or not? And have, have any carriers actually committed to that? Or are you still in that process of which ones are going to have plans? Right. They have, they have the option. And we, we can't require carriers to participate in the exchange and participate in the shop. They have, they have the option to do that. Um, I believe that they will all participate. Um, and we're going through that. I think we'll, we'll probably send out a letter of intent probably in January. And we'll let the Oregon Exchange send out their letter of intent. Um, this actually, first of this month. Um, so that's coming. But right now, we've got really good feedback from all the carriers. I meet with them on a, regular, on a weekly basis, and I think they're, they're all going to participate. But thank you. Thank you, Keith. Particularly being, I figure you guys have a little bit of work to do uh, these days. I'm curious about is the other states that in the last week have been coming out saying, okay, now maybe we need to think about building an exchange. I'm not quite sure how that's going to work for them. Uh, I'm glad we at least have a head start here. Um, when Bob started talking about this health care reform legislation, it gave me a uh, reason to pause and think it's actually been two years and eight months since this bill was signed into law. Did that go fast? I sat there thinking about in two years, eight months, I'm going to think about sending my little girl off to college. I don't want that time to go that fast. But I also know that the time between now and uh, January 1, 2014 is going to go very quickly. So uh, I guess one of the things that I'm going to emphasize is I think it's time we talk. And, uh, and I don't mean that in an uh, intimidating way, because if my wife ever says that to me, I, I get really worried. <laughs> but I think it is time we talk, because quite honestly, a lot of us have been able to put off thinking about a lot of the aspects of this. I've had a lot of people say, uh, 2014, that's a long way away. Or let's wait till after the Supreme Court rules, or let's wait, wait till after the election. And I think we're out of let's wait till afters, because it is now time. We know what we have to a great extent. We're going to get a flood of regulations here. They're probably starting in the next week or two. We're going to start seeing a lot of things addressed by HHS. Uh, so we are going to have a lot of things to talk about. So in my time here, I want to emphasize some of the things that we've been talking to employers about and some of those things that I think we need to probably be talking more about in the, in the coming months. As Bob emphasized, one of the challenges that I had when I looked at the list of people that were coming to this, people come from very different uh, companies. And this is going to really impact people very differently, uh, depending upon size, demographics, uh, income distributions, plan design, contribution levels, uh, markets. Uh, and, and keeping in mind, too, that a lot of things, particularly when it comes to this employer mandate that Bob was talking about, it's not going to impact employers with fewer than 50 employees. It's not an issue there. But what we're having to start do, starting to do, 
is really focus in on the specifics of each employer and look about and look at how the specifics are going to impact your plan. And speaking of this mandate, Bob was uh, showing some slide prints on a, an impact analysis tool that we have that we can use on your data. We can get your demographic data, enter it into this tool, and really quantify what is the impact to your plan for this employer mandate. Because this is one area that I find a lot of employers are worried about. And then once we enter in their data, they may find that they don't have as much to worry about. That's been the trend with the analysis that we've done to date. Uh, even employers that have quite a few low-income employees were finding it's not, the, this is again the specific employer mandate, is not looking to impact them that significantly. Uh, the big question is, as Bob pointed out in detail, do you offer affordable coverage to all your full-time employees? And certainly there's going to be more impact the larger the number of lower paid workers and if you're excluding certain classes. And as I say that, it occurred to me too, Bob, one of the things that we haven't talked about are the discrimination rules. And, and that's something that affects some employers here today because we have clients, particularly in the hospitality industry, retail, that have different classes of benefits for different classes of employees. And the, one of the rules of the original uh, law was that fully insured plans could no longer discriminate uh, against classes of employees. We haven't heard much about that though, have we, Bob? And we do have employers that have held on to their grandfather status because of that reason. But uh, that's another wait and see issue because they have not uh, issued any regulations around how that's going to work. Bob talked about, uh, well, I I'm going to talk about this concept of dropping coverage. Bob talked about it somewhat. And um, we haven't had too many employers that have actually brought that up as, as a strategy that they are looking to deploy. But when I thought through what are some of those implications, Bob talked about some of those. One thing that occurred to me as you look at the law, certainly the penalty that the government can assess to employers uh, for not offering coverage to their full-time employees, that penalty could increase. So as we do the, this math, do these calculations, it, that, the, the result may change as we go forward. Because every time I look at the CBO estimates of the cost of this uh, law, it seems to go up by $1,000 every time they, they issue a new number. I was commenting to Bob that it reminds me of that quote from years back, I'm going to show my age here, that a billion dollars here, a billion dollars there, and suddenly we're talking real money. And if anybody can tell me who actually said that, I'd be impressed. The answer is Everett McKinley Dixon. Okay. What, 1796 or what? <laughs> 1964. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, well, okay. Um, the other thing is, it's going to be interesting to see is how expensive is this coverage that individuals can get through the exchange. So you as an employer may make a decision to terminate your group plan, allowing your employees to go out and get coverage. Maybe you decide you're going to subsidize that, give them cash and lube and benefits so they can go buy the coverage. What's it going to cost them? We don't know the answer to that. We do know that there is the potential that it's going to be more expensive than what we have seen on an individual basis to date. The carriers are really starting to prepare us for that. I was at a meeting at the Regents Blue Shield last week, and they estimated that the increased cost to buy individual coverage, they probably wouldn't like it if I said this, but it's going to go up significantly, 50 60%. Now, there's two reasons for that. One is going to be it's going to impact different people differently because of the way the regulations require that the carriers set their age banding for the pricing. It's a real compressed age banding. And so it means that the younger people are going to pay more and the older paid people will pay relatively less. Having a conversation with our client at the University of Washington, they have a lot of students that may be able to go get coverage on the exchange. But what's it going to cost them? We don't know the answer to that. Now we do know it's going to cost more for individual coverage than what we've seen in the past on average just because of the required benefits, the essential benefit coverage levels. It's very different coverage than what the average buyer currently is purchasing on the individual marketplace. Okay, So that's going to be interesting. Uh, Bob mentioned the possible effect on work comp in terms of the rating on work comp. It's also going to be interesting to see if, is there any effect on health care costs that typically would have got, been paid under a group plan that would find themselves uh, uh, going into the work comp. Uh, absenteeism, uh, our favorite new word, presenteeism, could certainly also be impacted. Greg talked about what we're doing as an employer in tying our health plan and our wellness incentives. 
How does that get impacted if the employer says we're no longer going to offer a health plan? I don't know. Certainly big ones could be competition for employees. Based upon your marketplace, who are you competing with to attract and keep your best employees? Uh, that's going to be a huge driver. And then the other thing that's interesting to think about is if that employer decides they're no longer going to offer individual or offer their group coverage and allow their employees to go out and, and buy their individual coverage through, the, through these exchanges, what role does the employer play in helping them do that? Particularly if you have employees across different states, I think that that's going to be uh, a very interesting role to sort through. Keith Brick gave a good overview of the uh, the development of the shop exchange. Do we have an official name for the shop exchange, Keith? The exchange is called Washington Health Plan Finder. Is our okay. Okay. I think I can remember that. I love California's because they had a contest to try and name theirs. It's either going to be Choice California or Avocado, which <laughs> you guys are California. Um, what our role is as a broker really isn't going to be changing as far as this is concerned. As Keith mentioned, uh, we will have the ability to assist you find uh, out whether or not this is the right place or not to purchase coverage. I do want to emphasize, as he did say, this initially is going to be for the small employers. So initially starting in 2014, we're talking about employers with fewer than 50 employees. And then 2016, it goes up to 100 employees, and it may go beyond that. But initially, uh, starting in 2014, we are talking to smaller employers. But again, we really need to see what these plans are going to look like. Although we have a pretty good idea of the framework of the plan design based upon a specific region's ANOVA plan. Uh, so we have a pretty good idea of that. We certainly have no idea what these plans are going to cost yet. So if employers ask, well, is it going to be more affordable for us to buy this coverage through the exchange? We cannot answer that question yet. Full-time versus part-time is a, a conversation topic that's coming up with a number of employers, just depending upon if they have the part-time and seasonal employees. Uh, I mentioned the hotels, restaurants, retail. One of the things that we know we need to do in working with employers is help them uh, redefine perhaps the eligibility uh, of their plan and define the measurement and the stability periods that Bob was talking about. I'm not sure how complicated that will be for some employers, uh, but if you do have a lot of new hires during the course of the year, looking in that timeline, I can see that that might get to be a little bit of a complicated exercise. Um, there certainly are some technology solutions that we can suggest to you that might help in that effort, but uh, we'll see how much of a burden that places on employers. But this issue of part-time versus full-time is getting some press. Uh, just earlier this week, I think it was on Monday, there was a New York franchisee for Applebee's restaurants commenting that uh, this health care reform law in this aspect in particular was going to uh, lead to hiring and building freezes, and it was going to cost billions of dollars. It had a real impact on, on the labor markets. Well, immediately thereafter, and I love the, the world we're in, immediately thereafter, Applebee's was threatened with, uh, with um, uh, boycotts on uh, Facebook and Twitter. And of course, the national spokesman had to say, no, that's not us speaking, it was just a franchisee talking. Uh, but then, last week on this subject, there was a spokesperson for HHS that was quoted saying, the health care law will improve the affordability of health care while not significantly impacting the labor market. This law will decrease costs, strengthen our businesses, and make it easier for employers to provide coverage to their workers. Now, there's an optimistic outlook. Uh, this person probably also buys playoff tickets for the Mariners. I don't know. But uh, I will choose to remain optimistic about all that. Bob mentioned a case study that was done. This was for a Northwest employer. It's a ski resort. They have 100 year-round uh, full-time employees, and then about 400 full-time seasonal workers that work five to six months out of the year. And as you can see from this comparison, if there was no look back and stability period uh, uh, idea here that the government's proposed, this employer would have been paying out over $700,000 in additional premiums to cover those employees. But using that 12-month look back, those employees, those seasonal employees, do not have to be offered that coverage. So it makes a big impact. Uh, so if you do have seasonal employees, you do have hourly employees, this is a conversation we need to have with you to help you determine how to set that look back and stability period. One of the other subjects that I keep hearing about is self-insurance. And of course, self-insurance has been around for a long time. Now, what I, what's different is I'm hearing a lot of people saying because of the Affordable Care Act, employers need to be considering self-insurance. 
And I can see where that is true in some part, but I, I guess I'm a little bit, um, I, I get a little bit skeptical when I hear that. Particularly in the last two weeks, I've heard employers say that somebody came to them and said, you can save 25% if you're self-insured. And if you believe that we should talk afterwards, I can explain why you might save 25%, but why you might be in for a little bit of a renewal shock the next year. But um, the thing about it is, is that if you look at the elements of the Affordable Care Act, there are a couple of advantages that are specific to self-funded plans. You do not have to follow all the essential benefit rules. You also avoid the, the uh, insurance carrier excise tax. So all of that is true. But what is also different is we're seeing uh, more and more smaller employers wanting to look at self-insurance. I'm talking employers even with uh, fewer than 100 employees. And the carriers are developing products around this. And we have a couple of carriers in this market that have products that they are marketing. Um, now again, the benefits to being self-insured are the same really, I think, whether or irrespective of the Affordable Care Act or not. Those, those uh, elements of control, which the CFOs like to have, being able to get to, uh, get to the data to be able to impact their costs, the potential savings, and the flexibility in design, particularly if you have employees all over the country. Those advantages still persist regardless. Um, I think one of the interesting questions when it comes to self-insurance is, what about these smaller employers? What if you have the healthier smaller employers that decide that they don't want to be in a community rated pool where they're subsidizing somebody else? They want to be self-insured. They want to have their costs more tied to their own experience. And uh, it, it's going to be interesting to see how that affects the state risk pools. Will it be significant enough of a flow of employers and employees to self-insured plans? I don't really think so, but there's already conversation in the states and uh, at the federal level about this idea of cherry picking. And the concern again is, is that companies are creating these self-insurance products for smaller and smaller employers with lower and lower stop loss or caps on liability. Some have said these, some of these self-insured plans now look more just like high deductible insured plans. And so what it is resulting in is that the legislatures are now starting to talk about this. Well, in the past, really, the states have not had a lot of influence over self-insured plans. It's been more regulated by ERISA, by the federal government. But now we are having conversations, like I said, in places like California where they have proposed legislation, and I'm not sure where it's at at this point, where they would limit the stop loss, where you could not have an individual stop loss under $95,000. Well, if, if I'm a 60 or 70 employee company, and I might be interested in self-insurance, I'm probably not interested in a $95,000 cap for individual stop loss. That is a lot of liability. So I think it's going to be really interesting to see what direction those conversations take. I know there is some conversation uh, in Olympia as well regarding this. Um, the Office of the Insurance Commissioner has been having conversations about regulation of self-insurance as they have also about association plans. And some of you may be uh, have your coverage through association plans a lot of conversation right now about bona fide association plans. Um, are the true associations based upon a specific industry, or is it anyone can come and, uh, and sign up within that association? There are some association plans in this state that are uh, at risk of either having to change significantly who they offer their coverage to, or they may potentially even go away. Keith talked about the, the public exchange, the state exchange. We are now hearing a lot of talk about private exchanges. Um, really what we are talking about, I think, is it, it's not totally different than what we've tried before. In fact, a lot of the stuff that we'll talk about in terms of trends, we've really tried before, I think. This is a little bit different, though. I think the real focus is, is in defined contribution approaches to offering health care, much like we've done with retirement plans, where we moved from defined benefit to defined contribution plans over the last 30 years or so. Uh, a lot of employers are saying, we want to fix our cost, our liability, 2x, and if the employees want to pay more and, and have flexibility select, makes for, uh, sense for themselves, let's give them an instrument to do that. And that's what these exchanges that are cropping up are intended to do. Um, they are really built around more sophisticated technology platforms than we saw in the past uh, variations of these exchanges. But essentially what we're talking about is either an insurance carrier or also brokers are offering these exchanges. And I know Regents has an exchange that they've offered. They call it, uh, is it Employee Select? Consumer Select, something like that. 
Uh, brokers who are starting to develop these, we are actually in the process of developing a private exchange as well through our Assurex affiliation. Uh, some people have said what it really is, it becomes almost kind of a, they, they call it a quasi-exit strategy, and I'm not sure I totally agree with that, but again, the idea being that employer that's saying, uh, you know what, we need to offer something, but we cannot pay any more than X. And so an exchange like this certainly can, uh, can result in fixing their contribution. My one concern with it is, as I'm hearing these things get marketed, is that thought that somehow these private exchanges are going to magically reduce the cost of the underlying insurance, and I don't expect that to happen. Again, it'll offer some choice and a, and a nice platform for people to make their choice, but it's not going to make the cost necessarily go away. It'll just fix the employer cost. A few more trends uh, to talk about in my last few minutes here. Um, product design trends, we're seeing Again, increased flow of plans to uh, consumer-driven health plans. Uh, Kaiser issued a little, what they call the snapshot report on Monday, showing that in 2012, 34% of employees will be enrolled in plans with deductibles over $1,000. And you know, five years ago, that would have been remarkable. Um, in fact, it was just in 2006, the percentage was 10%. So we're seeing a, a certain trend towards CDHP, seeing a trend towards total replacement, um, I learned that in the Microsoft Open Enrollment that they're now moving towards total replacement with an HSA plan. Now, they get to do it a little differently than most of us because the company gets to fund the, the, the uh, uh, savings account for the employees, but it is a transition point. I think it's very interesting. We're seeing more plans with the savings accounts, whether HRAs or HSAs, with conditional contributions that the employers are making. I thought the interesting one was 8% of employers were putting in a matching contribution into the savings accounts. Uh, the same study said that employees are much more agreeable to having an HSA if the employer puts money into it. And I thought, I hope they didn't pay a whole lot of money for that study. Uh, I could have told them. That. <laughs> We're also seeing more employers time their incentives or uh, making contributions to these accounts based upon incentives, um, results-based incentives. It is the new topic amongst wellness plans, right? We used to a lot of us put in wellness incentives based upon if you show up or if you get in on our website and do this, you'll get an incentive. More employers now are looking at ways that they can truly impact behaviors, and so they're looking to tie these uh, incentives towards actual metric-based or measurable uh, results. Uh, we do know that a lot of employers are putting in wellness incentives. Uh, more than a third of employers last year were offering incentives. Narrow networks is an interesting subject. Again, something that we've done before, but we're seeing will definitely come up again. Um, a new term I learned yesterday was we have in-network providers. Somebody used the term inner network providers. Inner network providers meaning that carriers are looking to create subsets of their provider networks through whom they and with whom they can negotiate better arrangements, oftentimes based upon quality of outcome measures, and wanting to direct the, the membership towards those providers. Our community here is really interesting as far as that goes, and it's probably reflective throughout the country where we've had so much consolidation with our provider groups. There are not many independent provider groups left. Even if you look at hospitals, how many independent hospitals are there left other than Overlake, uh, Evergreen, and Virginia Mason? I think that's it. And the physicians are following as well. So we're seeing these narrowed down networks being looked at by the carriers. We're also seeing differences in the way they're reimbursing or paying the providers. The terms they're using are, include global outcomes contracting, total cost of care, and in the future, capitation. Again, I think we did that. Um, it, it perhaps is a different marketplace. Perhaps the providers are a little more sophisticated to be able to work with capitation today. Uh, so we'll see how that works. And, and then last on my list, I had PCP-driven plans. Remember uh, the primary care physician-directed plans. The regions had their selections. That was the last one, I think, that we had. And prior to that, we did have HMOs in this marketplace. But now the carriers are again looking to create PCP-driven plans. And when I looked at this, I thought, I needed to probably cue up the Huey Lewis music and because and, uh, it just seems like we're going back to the future in many respects. And, and we do a lot of that. We do recycle ideas, but I think because of changes in technology, because of changes in the provider uh, provider um, structures. Some of this perhaps can work. It's going to be interesting to see how it all plays out. 
regardless, as I started out saying, I think it is, it's, it is time to talk. We've got a lot to talk about. Uh, we do have some time, but if you look at what's coming down the pike by uh, January 2014, and really with the open enrollment before then, we do have to start talking about a number of things. Um, one of the things, though, that, and I think, Greg, you commented on it, was that with the Accountable Care Act's focus on increasing access to health insurance, we as, as your consultants, you as employers, really have some work to do then to think about ideas to really impact or address costs and the quality of the health care that we're providing our employees. Because although there are aspects in the law that may be able to do something or impact this to some degree in the future, um, it's going to be a ways out. So if we really do want to think about how we can corral our costs, impact our costs, we need to be having the same conversations we should have been having prior to now, and that is how we can truly impact the health of our populations, create more efficient funding mechanisms, and better plan designs that work, work for your employees. So again, really our role isn't going to be changing. So we have some new avenues through which we can pursue coverage, but uh, what we do for you, I think, uh, is going to continue to be very similar in terms of helping you find the best uh, benefits for your employees. So I think, Greg, I wrote down your comment that we're going to alleviate some of the symptoms. And, and Bob commented about navigating through this change, and I had this image of uh, a sailboat being tossed around in choppy waters. Um, again, let's talk. Uh, we're available, and we look forward to a further discussion. So right now, I'd like Bob and Keith to come out up and answer some questions. <coughs> what that model has to look like yet. And um, does that apply to all employers or only those over 50 FTEs? Good question. And, and very timely, because we do know what the sum of benefits of coverage looks like. So there is a template that the government's provided, has released. And in fact, we have employers that have already ha been having to release these or produce these for their, their uh, employees. Fully insured plans, it's the insurance company that's producing these. Self-insured plans, oftentimes the administrator's creating these. But this applies to all employer sizes. So it's it's relevant now for probably everybody in the room. I can't think of any exceptions, Bob. No. So if you haven't had a conversation about your SBC, I will say this, that the carriers have been struggling with them. We have gotten uh, a number of them that were incorrect. Uh, we've had particularly third-party administrators that struggled in terms of producing them in a timely manner. Um, so again, probably something to, to be talking about right now. Just just two other quick comments on it. it, it it's, you're, you're required to do it in your first plan year, starting October. So if, you, if your plan year hasn't happened yet, you're, you're not required. The second thing, I do want to make a comment about, and this is, I take this very seriously, the Department of Labor has issued what's called a non-enforcement rule on the SBCs for the first year. And what that means, it's not just happy talk. What it means is they're, they are not going to enforce the detailed provisions of the SBC requirements as long as an employer is making a good faith attempt to comply for the first year. They're taking the, uh, the approach that they know this is difficult. People are having uh, insurers and employers are struggling to figure out exactly how this is going to work. So the first year, we have to do it. I mean, not sending it is not good faith compliance. <laughs> okay, But I'm not worried if it's not laid out perfectly or it has an extra page or stuff like that this first year as, as we learn how to do this. I have a friend that worked for the Department of Labor and she said when they say non-enforcement they mean it. They want to get this thing working. They're not going to come in and, and enforce penalties on employers that are trying to comply with the SBC rules for this first year. So that's good news. Um, I have a question on the, um, the Medicare Advantage Plan. Um, it's been around for a Twelve months start from the employees get up higher, and so we're running like constantly throughout the year. Or would it be possible to yeah. get rid of open enrollment? That's a good question. Once a year. Yep. Look back. Uh, unfortunately, I have to give you ten percent of that answer, and we're going to sit down with you one on one and figure that out for you. Both for new employees, the measurement period starts on date of hire. You measure me for my first twelve months to see if I earn full time status. And then on an ongoing basis, you have an, a measurement period that rolls every year for your existing employees. And we've got some good examples we can show how that work. But yeah, when you hire me, if I'm one of those employees, you're going to measure me in the first 12 months and you offer me coverage. And then once somebody's employed, there's an ongoing process. I, I know it's more detailed than that, but you. Yeah. Yep. Great. Question for Keith. Who are the other states in the country that we're 
Mm. Who are the other states in the country that we're following as far as development of um, the public exchange? Uh, Oregon and California, uh, Massachusetts. Uh, uh, closely, uh, Oregon has a model that um, for the shop that California has now adopted as well. Uh, and it's called a business entity, uh, where they basically create their own uh, agency within the exchange. And they get appointed by the carriers, and then they affiliate the agents. And the reason for doing that is that not every single agent is appointed to every single carrier. So if you have a, can you hear me? If you have a, uh, a, a, an agent that says that it's only appointed to group health, well, they can only sell products in the exchange that are, that are group health products. So we're trying to find a way to get around that so that we can bring all the agents and brokers to, to the exchange um, and not have a situation where they're just selling one specific product. So this question is well, will uh, the exchange be comprised just of insurance carriers, uh, probably that we know right now, or will the state have its own essentially insurance plan within the exchange? Uh, no, uh, right now it's, it will it'll be comprised of, of the carriers as we have them, as we know them right now. Um, and right now, um, I, I think those those carriers are going to be most likely Premier, Group Health, Regents, and Kaiser um, are, are pretty active right now. Um, we're not really hearing from anyone else. Very much. Um, when are we going to know whether or not the exchange is going to be I would say look for that around, I'm hearing December 19th. Um, the Tenant Central Healthcare Benefits and the OIC will come out with those uh, around that date. So coming soon. And there was just a news release this morning. I saw that HHS is hoping to get more information on that even in this next week. So that's, that's going to be coming pretty soon. Yeah. I, I want to comment on the, because I, I, there's, a, there's a lot of confusion around this term. And I want to make sure we clarify this term. The essential health benefits that Keith is talking about are the benefits that small group fully insured plans have to offer. Only small group fully insured plans. If you're over 50 employees, over 100 employees, or you're self-funded, you're not required to offer what's called the essential health benefit set. Those are the 10 benefits that Keith mentioned that all the small group plans are going to offer. I'm afraid your question might be more relevant to what's called minimum value. All employers have to offer a minimum value plan to their employees to avoid the penalties. Okay? And unfortunately, the term used in the regulations for that one is minimum essential coverage. So we've got essential health benefits and minimum essential coverage. And I constantly hear the two intertwined and they're completely separate things. So Keith and, and, and his point is exactly right. They're going to introduce and announce the essential health benefit set for, you know, what kind of care, maternity care, what kind of this, what kind of that has to be in those plans. For the rest of you, your plan has to have what's called a minimum value, at least a 60% actuarial value to be a qualifying plan. Okay? And we know that we have actuarial rules around that. The Department of Health and Human Services is supposed to be releasing a calculator soon where we can punch in our deductibles and co-pays and RX co-pay and stuff, and the calculator will say, your plan has a value of 62.4%. Okay? In the meantime, we've got actuaries and underwriters that can help you figure that out, but hopefully that calculator will be out soon. And the point here, for those of you that are all this, I'm talking about large employers now, employers over 50, if you offer a $10,000 deductible plan with a $20,000 out of pocket, it's not going to be minimum value, right? It's, that's, it's, that can't be your base plan, okay? A minimum value plan is going to be something like a three or $4,000 deductible or better. And I'm really qualifying that carefully because it depends on lots of things. So I think it's really important that the large employers in the room, if you offer a $1,000 deductible plan with a $2,000 out of pocket, guess what? It's way over minimum value. You know, that's, that's awesome, all right? But if you're on the fence, if you're around the $2,500 to $3,000 or $4,000 deductible range, we need to look at it, or as soon as the calculator comes off from HHS, plug that in and make sure that's your qualifying minimum plan, okay? Anything else? One more. Primer gets the last one. 
This is for Bob. Um, if I'm an employer that has offered benefits to my employees working less than 30 hours in the past and, and contributed to them doing so, will I no longer want to even consider that? Okay, so, so great question. If you offer benefits to people working less than the 30 hour, less than full time, do you want to keep doing that? Um, that is completely up to you because the law has absolutely nothing to say about that. In other words, you can offer benefits to part timers, you can offer more, offer less. The ACA doesn't affect that. The only thing I say, I, I, only thing I would say is that the impact of that decision will be affected by your employees deciding what they want to do. Right? Your employees are going to pay a, a, a tax if they don't have benefits. So there might be some employee interest in that. That might change how you think about that. But the law doesn't require you to. It doesn't require how you offer to part-timers. That's completely up to you. Well, I want to thank uh, Keith for being here today, as well as Bob Radke and, and Greg also. Thank you for your comments. But most of all, thank you for being here. And if you like me, your questions will pop in your head later. So if you do have questions, please call or email us. And like I said, we want to continue the conversation. There's a lot to, to be defined ahead. So thank you very much.